Math 31, welcome to example three. This is when we're going to look at restricting the domain of a function that is not one-to-one -one so that we can make it one-to-one -one and find its inverse function. And if this idea sounds familiar, it's because we took a look at it in section 3.7, example eight. And a lot of this section mirrors what we did in section 3.7. It's just the example problems are a little bit more intricate. All right, here we go. So if a function is not one-to-one, -one, it cannot have an inverse. If we restrict the domain of a function so that it becomes one-to-one, -one, thus creating a new function, this new function will have an inverse. So this was our workaround in math. If we found a function that wasn't one-to-one, -one, we just cut down its domain. We took a piece of its domain where the function was one-to-one, -one, and then we found its inverse. And that's what we're gonna do here. So if we take a look at this, it says find the inverse function of f of x equaling x squared plus one on the domain x greater than or equal to zero. So let's focus in on this function for a moment. I want you to think about the graph of x squared plus one. Now x squared plus one is one of our toolkit functions, excuse me, x squared is one of our toolkit functions. So I want you to try and graph this in your head before we actually talk about it and think what would that graph look like? And I hope you're thinking, well, I know what x squared looks like. It looks like a parabola, upward facing parabola and this plus one will shift my graph up one unit. So I'm hoping when you were graphing it, you had something in your head like this, right? My parabola, upward facing, right? Because the lead coefficient's positive, but it's been shifted up one unit from that origin. Now this passes the vertical line test, so it's a function, but you can see it fails the horizontal line test. If I send this line through it, it's gonna hit at two spots, so it fails the horizontal line test. So as written, this function is not one-to-one, -one, meaning it does not have an inverse. But we this was our workaround in math. We said, well, how about we don't take the whole parabola? Let's just take a piece. And according to how this example was set up, they said, take the piece of the parabola where x is greater than or equal to zero. Well, x being greater than or equal to zero means start at zero on the x-axis and head right. So what I'd like to do is just take this piece of the parabola, and if I only take the right half of the parabola, then it does become a one-to-one -one function, meaning it will have an inverse. Now, if you wanna graph piecewise functions on your calculator, it's been a little while since we've done this, but you wanna put parentheses around that binomial. So let me go ahead and put parentheses around x squared plus one. And then you're going to use your test menu here, it's in blue above the math key, and you need to type in your restricted domain. So I'm gonna also put that in parentheses, so I'm gonna do x. Now to get to greater than or equal to, we do second in math, and then all, oops, that was not second in math, sorry about that, let me head back. I'm gonna hit second in math, I hit second in matrix accidentally. But here we go, when we do second in math, here's all of those symbols that you could have for equalities or inequalities, and we want option four for greater than or equal to zero. So once you've told your calculator which piece of the function you want, then when you hit zoom six or you hit graph, you'll see, well, there's the right half of the parabola, and that is one-to-one. -one. It's going to pass the horizontal line test. So we restricted this domain so that our function would become one-to-one, -one and that new function will have an inverse, all right? So let me just write that up so we have that down. So restricting, oops, let me write the word restricting correctly. So restricting the domain makes our function one-to-one. -one. And that means f inverse exists and then that means we can go find it, right? And that was our original direction, find this inverse function. Now, when I'm dealing with functions and their inverses, I like to, if possible, find the domain and range of my original function, because I know then when I head over and find the inverse, the domains and ranges between your original function and your inverse function flip-flop. The domain becomes the range, and the range becomes the domain. So with that, I'm gonna just put here we already know the domain of my original function. We just said it was x is greater than or equal to zero. If I, if I write that up as an interval, that's zero to infinity. Now, if I wanna look at the range, I wanna go low to high. Well, this is my lowest point, 
and it looks like I go up forever, so I'm gonna have a positive infinity. Um, it looks like my lowest point is the y-intercept. Let me see what that number is. If I plug in zero, it's one, right? Oh, I could have done that in my head also, but it looks like my range then is one to infinity. Okay. And all this means, it just gives me some grounding for, I know the domain of my inverse function will be one to infinity, and I know the range of my inverse function will be zero to infinity, because these domains and ranges flip-flop when you go from original to inverse. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and do some flip-flopping. Let's um, find our inverse function. Now, the first thing you wanna do is swap out x's and y's. Wherever you see a y, write an x. Wherever you see an x, write a y. And f of x is our symbol for y, so I'm just going to rewrite this as y equaling x squared plus 1. All right, so the first step, rewrite, or excuse me, swap out x and y. All right, so I've swapped out x and y. Wherever I saw a y, I wrote an x. Wherever I saw an x, I wrote a y. And then your next step is to actually solve for your new y. So I'm going to have y squared equaling, looks like, x minus 1. So y will either equal the positive or negative square root of x minus one. And I need to decide, these, both of these roots, the positive and negative square root, those aren't both my answers. I only need one of these. So I have to decide, do I want the positive square root of x minus one, or do I want the negative square root of x minus one? And how you decide is we're gonna look at their domains and ranges. Only one of these, will line up with the domain and range that we want. So let's go figure this out. For both of these, in terms of their domain, um, I have a radical with an even index, so I need the radicand to be positive. I basically need x minus one to be greater than or equal to zero. That's saying I need x to be greater than or equal to one. So my domain on both of these functions would be one to infinity, and it should be. Right? I said domains and ranges flip-flop. So you see the range of my original function became the domain of my inverse function. That's, that's in line with what I think. So this is going to be the key. All right? If the domain of my original function was 0 to infinity, then the range of my inverse function should be 0 to infinity. So we've got to decide what the ranges are for these. All right, square root of any quantity, square root of x, it's one of your toolkit functions. So let's just really quickly graph the square root of x. If you remember, it looks like this, right? y equals square root of x. Now, if you have x minus 1, remember when you have a minus 1 inside your grouping symbol, it's counterintuitive. You don't shift left 1, you actually shift to the right 1. So let's graph this. I'm going to move this just to the right by one unit. I will start it at 1, that was my domain, and then there is my toolkit function. Okay, do we remember back from transformations what happens when you have a negative out in front of that grouping symbol? Well, that means I'm still going to start at 1, but I'm going to reflect over the x-axis. Alright, so let's talk about the range of this function and then the range of this other function. Okay, the range of this function, it looks like I'm starting at zero and I'm going up forever. So I'm gonna go zero to infinity. Here I was at zero and I go down forever, but we write our ranges as low to high. So my range here is negative infinity to zero. And with those being written out, we can actually pick which of these will be our inverse function. The domain of your original, should become the range of your inverse. So these are the ones that match up, right? Zero to infinity, zero to infinity. So that means square root of x minus one, the positive square root, is going to be my inverse function. So let me move this up so we can keep writing this, this example. So once I decide which one I want, and I want this, the positive square root, I will rewrite that as f inverse of x is the square root of x minus one. All right, so just make, let me make sure I write this out so we, we see why. So we will take, can we see all of my handwriting? Yeah. We will take the positive square root because the range of f inverse of x must be zero to infinity.
So it's got to be zero to infinity, all right? Because it's got to be the domain of my original function, okay? All right, so with that, we're just going to move over to two problems in general. We're going to start go from start to finish. We'll decide how to restrict the domain if we need to, how to find that inverse function. And uh, yeah, we'll do it with a radical and then a rational. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Bye.